Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash. Jacob, it's time for This Week in Prophecy. Today is Friday, June 23rd, 2017. Greetings in Jesus from London, England. This Week in Prophecy. As usual, major events in the Middle East that are being overlooked or underreported by the mainstream press in some cases, certainly major events in Europe and Britain of prophetic significance, as well as events in the United States that have prophetic or potentially prophetic ramifications for events across the Atlantic and in Israel. Let's begin. Quite a week it was. I'll begin with the Middle East this week. A number of very significant events have taken place this week that are not given pride of place in the mainstream media outside of the Middle East. I don't think that many people are aware of the importance, formatively, of these events taking place. The first major event is there has been a major adjustment in the Royal House of Saud, which is effectively the government of Saudi Arabia. A new crown prince has been appointed. Saudi Arabia's king has appointed his son, Mohammed bin Salman, as crown prince, replacing his nephew, Mohammed bin Nayef, as first in line to the throne. King Salman's decree also means 31-year-old Prince Mohammed bin Salman will become deputy prime minister while continuing as defense minister. He's been responsible for organizing Riyadh's war with Yemen and dictating the country's energy policy. 57-year-old Mohammed bin Nayef has pledged allegiance to the new crown prince. Insiders say the 31-year-old's promotion confirms him as next ruler of the kingdom. The surprise announcement follows two and a half years of major changes in Saudi Arabia including the war in Yemen and major changes in energy policy. Mohammed bin Salman. He is a reformer. Now, by a reformer, I don't mean a social reformer or a reformer in the sense of anything going to change the religious and cultural fabric of Saudi Arabia. He is an economic reformer committed to diversification of the economy. He's only 31 years old. But again, because of nepotism, he's effectively controlling foreign and defense policy and much of the economy already. Hence, he displaced the sitting crown prince and is now next in line to become king of Saudi Arabia when his father, who's 81 years old, is forced to retire for reasons of age. His father has been king of Saudi Arabia only since 2015. It's a geriocracy. What you see now in Saudi Arabia is a switch between a geriocracy, a government of old people who date their heritage back to the descendants of Ibn Saud in 1932, who established the present nation, Saudi Arabia. When in a jihad, the Wahhabists, that is the Salafists in league with religious extremists, drove the family of King Musharraf out of power. They gained support and recognition based on the politics of oil from the Roosevelt administration at that time, seated in Washington, and that began this strategic relationship between the United States and one of the most anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, anti-human rights, suppressive regimes in history that endures to this day, and hypocritically one American administration after another ignores. That includes Carter administration, includes the Nixon administration, the Ford administration, it includes the Reagan administration, it includes the Bush administration above all. As I've said many times, the Saudis partners with the Bush family in the Carlisle Group, an investment concern with James Baker 
And uh, it's continued with Barack Obama, and unfortunately, it seems to be continuing with Donald Trump. He did not address the human rights issues, the Saudi funding of extremism, oppression of religious freedom, of women's rights, of human rights. He addressed none of that. Chiefly, he did not address what should be the major concern, Saudi funding of Salafism and Wahhabist extremist mosques, madrasas and institutions in other countries, including the United States, which engender support for jihad to establish global sharia. That is their long-term ambition. That is what their clergy teaches. And of course the American government stands by and does nothing. And Mr. Trump has not been an exception. Perhaps not as bad as Mrs. Clinton would have been, but he's certainly no better than the others thus far in his Saudi policy. What is interesting is, though, that Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, who is Jewish, had a meeting and a dining experience with Prince bin Salman. Uh, the fact that a member of the House of Saud would literally eat with a Jew and discuss politics and business with a Jew shows you the direction the country is going. They're putting business first, and they're putting the common threat of Iran first. There are already secret liaisons between Israeli high-tech companies, the Israeli government, and Saudi Arabian business interests. Remember, the House of Saud, these several thousand princes, are the elite of that country, and they're also effectively the government of that country. There's not a distinction. It's something from the Dark Ages. It's something that a Western mind would have a difficult time understanding. The old regime, his father, his 81-year-old father, is again 81 years old. So you're seeing a shift in power now between the older generation going back to Ibn Saud of 1932 and this next generation. Now, before the House of Saud came to power with the backing and partnership of the Salafist clergy, the Wahhab, before this took place, the previous regime, the previous king of Saudi Arabia, King Musharraf, who was also pro-Western, King Musharraf stated Israel was a place for the Jews. He stated that. It was the House of Saud who came to power and changed that position and they began subsidizing everything from the publication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and anti-Semitic forgery to radical mosques and madrasas and anti-Israel propaganda and indirectly to terrorist aligned interests in a number of places including Gaza. Well, this seems to be changing with Bin Salman. Again, he is not a reformer in any religious or social sense. His game is purely political and economic. Something is happening in Saudi Arabia. And it's something that has to be understood to understand the prophetic direction events in the Middle East are taking. It's very significant. The Iranian threat plays supreme. Iran and Saudi Arabia are involved in a proxy war with the Houthi in Yemen. The United States just killed the day before yesterday in an airstrike or in a drone strike one of the leaders of Al-Qaeda in uh, Yemen, Abu uh, Qatab al-Ghazi. Al Abu Qatab al Awul Aki, sorry, Awul Aki. The United States killed him. The United States is backing Saudi Arabia in this conflict, but it's been dragging on for two years and it shows no sign of ending. Related to this is the Saudi Arabian fallout with Qatar. Qatar, uh, Qatar hosts Al Jazeera and a number of Islamic countries are unhappy with its association with radical Islamic groups that are terror-related, and with Iran. Turkey and Iran have jumped to the defense of Qatar against Saudi Arabia. At this point, the cards are being played by the new 
crown prince. So he will make and is making a reproachment with Israel. He's very concerned with Iran. He's dogged by the efforts to gain some kind of a victory in Yemen, and now a conflict with Qatar. But there is a third dimension, the Saudi economy. He has been desperate to diversify it. He is one of the chief movers on back of the plans to issue an IPO, an initial public offer, of the main Saudi oil company, um, Aram uh, Saudi Aramco. This would probably be the biggest <coughs> public offer of shares in history. Largely, it's going to be broken through London and somewhat through New York. But it will be the largest in history if it happens. There is a fear, however, among the old guard in Saudi Arabia that this will create a financial instability. In order to diversify the economy of Saudi Arabia, stability is required. But because of events in neighboring Yemen, because of the problems with Qatar, and because of the threat with Iran, stability is not there strategically from the point of view of foreign relations and defense. The fear now becomes neither will it be there financially and economically. No matter what happens, no matter what OPEC does, there is a new player at the table now, and there is nothing they can do about it. Technological improvements in horizontal drilling in the United States by American technology companies involved in oil exploration have made fracking more and more profitable at a lower and lower cost. Saudi Arabia can no longer control OPEC, and OPEC can no longer control international oil prices. Neither can Russia, even though all of these will remain players at the table. Russia will be a factor. Saudi Arabia will certainly be a factor. They can no longer be the controlling factor. So efforts to diversify the economy away from oil create an environment where the way the economy functions and has functioned for decades now is going to be progressively uprooted in the transition at a time when there is regional strategic instability, now compounded by a big economic question mark. Can he do it? Saudi Arabia is being forced to diversify its economy and to make changes. It's being forced to do so. If it doesn't, it's going to find itself increasingly in fiscal straits. Its sovereign wealth fund will eventually be eroded. Saudi Arabia subsidizes everything. It's an oil-based economy that subsidizes everything. Education, student loans, social welfare, everything is oil-based subsidy given out by the House of Saud to maintain and placate a population in order to keep the House of Saud in power. At the same time, they have to placate the Wahhab clergy, radical Salafis, Sharia fanatics. At the same time, they have to keep their eye on Iran and its adjutant states. At the same time, they have to play ball increasingly with the West. They can no longer dictate about oil prices as they once did. This is merging into a very, very interesting state of affairs. They are being forced, forced by the realities of Iran and the need for stability to diversify the economy to make some kind of an agreement with Israel. Some kind. Meanwhile, the hypocrisy goes on. The Saudi Arabian government is allowed to continue to subsidize mosques and Islamic institutions that are pro-Sharia and that indirectly, and in some cases, some would say directly, engender support for terror. This week in Britain, something unique happened. What Donald Trump did not address, no American government wants to address, somebody inadvertently addressed in Great Britain. 
It was a left center Labour Party politician, Emily Thornberry, who stated publicly that she's more concerned with not upsetting Britain's Muslim population, in effect, than she is with maintaining security, because there are 3,000 known radical Muslims registered with the police in Britain, who the police know about, who British intelligence know about. They're not registered by them registering, but the police maintain a database of who they are. 3,000 who have not been rounded up. She has made some reference to this, which has gotten her in political trouble because the Muslims scream and yell at anything. We need to ask the Saudi Arabians about their funding of mosques, fundamentalist mosques, Sharia mosques in Great Britain. Every Western government, British and American, has ignored this, but a left-wing politician inadvertently, perhaps not even intentionally, addressed the issue no one else would or has. That is the central issue in Western relationships with Saudi Arabia. Undoubtedly, the Israelis will address it, including Saudi funding to interests in Gaza. Nonetheless, again, you have a generational issue compounding the economic and strategic issue. It is something that is sociological. Now, when something is sociological in Saudi Arabia, it also has not only political ramifications, but religious ones. Simply because he's not a geriocrat, simply because he's not an old man, the young people of Saudi Arabia warm towards the new crown prince. But they have a problem with the fact that his economic programs are going to cut the subsidies upon which they are reliant. You have a padded government bureaucracy that's unbelievable. Someone related to the House of Saud will have an administrative position in a government office, not based on qualification, but based on nepotism. He will have a degree of some kind. Usually they study in the West, they study abroad. They generally speak English quite well. But he'll come into work late, he'll sip tea and socialize, read the newspapers, whatever he does, and he'll do a minimum of work. Then he'll go out to lunch and might not come back. The, the whole Saudi civil service runs this way. This privileged class. The people are reliant on subsidies that are funded by oil. And now, with the decline of the power of oil in Saudi Arabia and the need to diversify, everything's brought into question. Everything. There's a sociological upheaval now between the generations. There's an economic transition. And there's a new defense situation existing that has not existed before. This was in part brought about by the enabling of Barack Obama and John Kerry to increase vitality and the virility of the Iranian threat. Yesterday, Iran had a huge stage, a huge march and parade. Oh, that's a 
دریای شار و تأمین مناطق عملیات مرزی بخشی از تلاش های توانی روز قهرمان است به یادگار بیش از هزار سر به بردون کفن که در برابر تازیانه طوفان ایستادن سیاد و نامجوی وارسان فلاحی و همتی رهبویان با درود بی پایان به عزیزانی که در سالهای دفاع مقدس از روسفیدان بهشت فرحی از روسفیدی مردمانت و نقش سرخی از و آبشناسان به حرمت ذکر زیارت آشورای سیاد در صحیفه مرساد به خون سرخ هنجره اسماعیل انقلاب عباس بابایی به ستاره درخشان دفاع در طریق ولایت باشیم و حامیان حریم اسلام و انقلاب تاریخ انقلاب سرخط دفاع در ایرانه شیروتی کشوری و وطن پورهای خود را اختره گرفتن ایران امروز بیانگر توانمندی جهادگران انقلابی و با بصیرت ارتش سرفرازمان است که با تکیه بر نیست خود روی منریز تاکتیکی از جمله خود است که توسط جهاد خودکفایی نیروی زمینی ارتش بهین سازی و نوآوری شده و همچنین نفربر تجسسی شیمیایی هستهی رادیواکتیو و میکروبی شهرام و خودرو تاکتیکی ارتقا یافته هیدر شش و همچنین دیگر تجهیزاتی که امروز بیانگر توانمندی جهادگران ارتش سرفراز ایران اسلامی هستند تانک تیام نیز نمونه ای از اقدامات نوآورانه در جهاد خودکفایی نیروی زمینی قهرمان است سلاح ما در جنگ نرم امروز ما هوشیاری و بصیرت انقلابی جهادگران و فرزندان متخصص ارتش حزب الله است همچنان که ملت شریف ایران شاهد رژه تانک های زلفقار و تانک های مدرنیزه شده در محل رژه هستند در سراسر میهن اسلامی دلاور مردان ارتش حزب الله ارتش ولایت بدار ارتش مؤمن و انقلابی نیز برای دشمنان قدرت نمایی می کنند و برای ملت شریفمان امنیت و آرامشی که حاکی از حضور دلاوران من و خون شهدای عزیز من است یادآوری می شود حاصل دست رنج عزیزان من در حوزه های مختلف خودکفایی ارتش سرفراز ایران اسلامی است توپ خودکششی چرخدار بهمن 57 و همچنین خودروهای ارتش سرفراز ایران اسلامی همچون برق و سائقه بر سر توطعه گران که در اوردلان گردید همچنان شاهد رژه بخش های از تجهیزات بهین سازی شده و بازسازی شده موشکی نیروی زمینی قهرمان ارتش جمهوری اسلامی ایران هستیم ما دلاور ارتش حزب الله علیه السلام نردبام آسمان در کنار سنگرهای پدافندیان است که به خدا نزدیکترند و در نگاه هایی که آسمان را محصور خود کرده اند ای پدافندیان قهرمان سی قرارگاه پدافند هوایی خاتم الانبیا هستیم 
که امنیت هوا فضایی این سرزمین الهی را تأمین می کنند لبک یا رسول الله لبک یا حسین لبک یا رهبر و ای مقتدا تا پای جان ایستاده ایم این چونین است که فرماندهی معظم کل قبا فرمودند امروز پدافند در آرایش نیروه هر واقف می شود درست بود باید پدافند یک هویت مستقل در with floats of missiles capable of reaching Israel and hundreds of thousands of Iranians chanting death to Israel death to Israel death to Israel Israel can benefit from an alliance, even a secret one, with Saudi Arabia. If Israel was able to position F-15s, F-16s, and newer generation of American aircraft, uh, F-22s possibly, in Saudi Arabia, the overflight problems and the aerial refueling problems would be solved. It would put Iranian targets and Iranian nuclear sites in easy, easy targeting range of the Israeli Air Force and of Israeli missiles. This is what is beginning to take shape. Remember, Daniel chapter 10 tells us that Persia, Iran, will emerge as the strategic threat to Israel's existence. Quite a situation taking place in Saudi Arabia. It is very, very major. Its ramifications are huge. Meanwhile, the United States is unfortunately pressing ahead with negotiations with Abbas again, trying to revive a Middle East peace deal. Abbas, however, is trying to see Israel in a military conflict, an armed conflict, with Hamas in Gaza. Abbas's game is to try to use Israel to take out his opposition in Gaza. Once that goes, the influence of Gaza and the West Bank will also deteriorate, securing his own position of the corrupt Palestinian Authority. There's no good guy in this. There's not even a true lesser of evils. Nonetheless, politics as usual prevails. Mr. Trump has not changed the equation. He's not kept his pledge to move the embassy as yet, and he's not done anything about the Saudi sponsoring and funding of radical Islam globally. Nothing. Most unfortunate. But let's, at least he's not done it yet. But let's continue. These marches and rallies they had yesterday, this kind of fanaticism was resemblant of the era when the Shah fell and Ayatollah Khomeini came to power. The Israelis are noticing it. Again, it was facilitated in part by Barack Obama, who gave Iran virtually a green light to go nuclear due to inadequate inspections, due to non-inclusion of um, ballistic delivery systems of these weapons. Uh, the Obama administration was guilty of not just of a sellout of Saudi Arabia and of Israel, but of America. Uh, whether or not Valerie Jarrett was an Iranian al Jahis, I do not know. Whether or not Barack Obama was an Iranian agent, I do not know, but he certainly behaved like one. He certainly behaved like one. It, again, I've said this before, when we understand what he did, it would be difficult not to look upon it in the opinion of many people who have looked at it as tantamount to treason. Remember, his last act in office was the betrayal of Israel, facilitated with the help of left-wing American Jews such as Charles Schumer, Debbie Washerman Schultz, and others. 99, at the end of the last millennium and the last century, overwhelmingly, Israeli university and college students were pro-Zionist and supported Israel. By 2010, that had dropped to 84%, but still overwhelming. However, in six years, until 2016, and the latest statistics released, only 57% of American Jewish college and university students are pro-Zionist, are supportive of Israel. We have people who have sharpened the daggers for Barack Obama to put in the back of Israel. 
Charles Schumer, Senator of New York, Debbie Washington Schultz. These are people who have sharpened the daggers of Barack Obama to knife Israel in the back. Just yesterday, an American Jewish judge in Michigan, and I question if he had the juridical uh, authority, if he had the jurisdiction to do it, it's being contested. A judge named Martin Goldsmith in Michigan, a judge in Michigan, a Jewish American judge, Martin Goldsmith, issued a court order, an injunction, preventing the Trump administration from deporting 100 Iraqi criminals, people arrested, charged, convicted of major crimes, of felonies, whom Donald Trump wants to deport, but whom this Jewish American judge, Goldsmith, issued an injunction preventing it, wanting further juridical processes and so forth. This is absurd. These are people that I've described before as menlouses. Men allows being that Jew, the chief of the Jews, who collaborated with Antiochus Epiphanes in the story of the Maccabees, predicted and prophesied in the book of Daniel. Again, this will happen again in the last days. When the Antichrist makes his covenant with death, it betrays Israel, and Israel makes that covenant of death with him. And the abomination of desolation winds up standing in the holy place as it did in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes. It's going to be facilitated the same way it was in the days of the Maccabees. Menelauses, Meshumids, traitors to the Jewish people, even people who have betrayed the interests of the United States. Again, I'm speaking of people like Schumer and Washerman Schultz, left-wing liberal Democrats who facilitate this kind of pandering to Islam. The Antichrist will make a false peace, and you can bet the left-wing Jewish community will support him. You can absolutely guarantee what happened in the story of the Maccabees, in the book of Maccabees, what was predicted by Daniel. We can be absolutely certain it will happen again, and indeed it is already beginning to happen again. Betrayal of America's interest, betrayal of America's friends, and betrayal of Israel. And at the forefront of that betrayal, many times, is a left-wing, secular Jew. Religious Jews have other problems. But let us continue. Israel has seen a high-tech boom. This has indeed been a boost to the economy that was traditionally reliant on things like agricultural production, tourism, and light industry manufacturing. The high-tech boom has been a salvation to Israel because Israel has seen a drastic decrease in the tourism industry. It has been, the high-tech boom has been vital to the preservation of the Israeli economy because of a drastic decrease in the tourism industry. Tourism as an industry in Israel has decreased rather drastically. Additionally, most people are unaware of the fact that one-third of Israeli Jewish families live below the poverty line. One-third of Jewish children in Israel live below the poverty line. Now, of course, much of this is accounted for by immigrants um, from Russia, Ethiopia, places like that. Nonetheless, a third of the Jewish population lives below the poverty line, and many Israeli Arabs, most Israeli Arabs, live above the poverty line. Of course, the media does not tell us that. Israel has major problems, sociologically and economically. It is a divided state between the religious and the secular. It is a divided state between the immigrants and the sabras, the Israelis who were born there. It is a country that is basically held together in many respects by the common threat, the common enemy. And as Daniel 10 predicts, that enemy is becoming less and less Arab and more and more 
Persian. Less and less Arab and more and more Persian. The Arab threats that we see against Israel, such as Hezbollah, are Iranian agents. They're Iranian animated. The threat from Syria, they're Alawites. They're a sect of Shia Islam controlled and in league with Iran. So even what Arab threat presently exists is being animated by Shia Iran. Sunnis are dividing with each other. Qatar is being alienated by other Arabs. Strange, very strange, Iran and Turkey jump to the defense of Qatar. Qatar, however, has just bought a four and three quarter percent stake in American Airlines. A lousy airline, from my experience, but they bought a four and three quarters percent stake in it. We let these people who are in bed with the Iranians make capital investments in the American economy. I had hoped that Mr. Trump would have stopped this kind of sellout that so much defined the Bush administration. The Bush administration would have sold this country lock, stock, and barrel to radical Muslims. That's the way they were. They were in the Carlisle group and they just didn't care. The Carlisle Group is a global alternative asset management group. In a nutshell, they buy and sell companies using private investors' money. The story of the Carlisle Group is the story of a new kind of capitalism emerging in America. We'll start the story with this guy, Frank Carlucci. He had served in a variety of government positions, but from 1987 to 1989, he was serving as the United States Secretary of Defense for Ronald Reagan. He changed the rules on procurement at the Pentagon so that companies would be put on long-term supply contracts. He also had to cooperate with Operation 111 Wind, an investigation looking into corruption at the Pentagon with officials being bribed to secure large defense contracts. Six days after he finished his term as defense secretary, he went straight to the Carlisle Group and he advised Carlisle to take a look at a company called BDM. They had been hit hard by Operation Wind and their share price had plummeted. Eventually, Carlisle acquired BDM for $130 million. It was a steal because it turned out that BDM were on a long-term contract with the Pentagon. Is it possible that a person like Frank Carlucci might have known which companies were on long-term contracts and which were not? Who knows, but the Carlisle Group sold BDM in 1997 for $975 million. After Frank Carlucci came the appointment of James Baker, he had worked in politics for 18 years. He'd led presidential campaigns for President Ford, Reagan and Bush. He'd served as Chief of Staff, as Secretary of the Treasury and eventually as Secretary of State under George Herbert Walker Bush. He was and is a big deal. People know me. I'm kind of a big deal. But it wasn't going to just be former White House staff joining the ranks at Carlisle. Before long, the former president himself, George Bush Sr., would be giving speeches on Carlisle's behalf. He was senior advisor to Carlisle's Asia Investment Board. Neither the Carlisle Group nor the former president have been forthcoming in the way that he was remunerated for his relationship with the Carlisle Group. The former South Korean president, Park Tae-joon, was also now working for Carlisle, and he'd helped them secure nearly $1 billion in Coram Bank. So when George Bush Jr. gave the United States a pretty radical change in policy towards North Korea, North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction while starving its citizens. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil arming to threaten the peace of the world by seeking weapons of mass destruction. It did not go down well in South Korea. <laughs> It caused a lot of tensions when the new policy provoked North Korea into doing what it does best, issuing threats. 
and threats and instability are not good for business. It was widely reported at the time that Daddy Bush, still acting in his role of Carlisle's Asia advisor, sent a strongly worded memo to his son through a former ambassador, and he argued that he should continue negotiations with North Korea, and sure enough, by July, the Secretary of State announced that talks with North Korea would resume. Perhaps it was simple fatherly advice. Nevertheless, it showed just how much influence Daddy Bush had over policy in the United States, whilst he worked for a private company profiting from decisions that government made. Before long, the Carlyle Group found themselves at the center of a huge controversy. On September the 11th, 2001, Carlisle were holding their annual investors dinner in Washington DC. In attendance was James Baker, Frank Carlucci and George Bush Sr. who left on the morning of the attacks. Also in attendance was a man by the name of Shafiq bin Laden, the half-brother of Osama bin Laden. And it was just six days later that George Bush Jr., the current president, would name Osama bin Laden as the prime suspect. There's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. The bin Laden family maintained they had severed all contact with their estranged brother in 1991 when he lost his Saudi citizenship. But the connections between Bush Sr. and the Bin Ladens through the Carlisle Group raised a few eyebrows in the United States at the time. Carlisle said that the Bin Laden family had invested just $2 million. But other sources said the actual amount was much higher. The Wall Street Journal ran an article suggesting that Bush, Baker and Carlucci had all met with the Bin Laden family at their headquarters in Jeddah on more than one occasion and that in the ensuing war on terror, the Bin Laden family might actually profit from the hunt for their own brother because of their investments in Carlisle. So Carlisle were forced to terminate the relationship between themselves and the Bin Laden family, and it was all pretty embarrassing, but they managed their way through the PR catastrophe quite well. Cynthia McKinney, who sat in the House of Representatives at the time, said it is known that President Bush's father through the Carlisle Group had at the time of the attacks joint business interests with the Bin Laden Construction Company and many defense industry holdings, the stocks of which have soared since September the 11th. It all looked pretty damning on paper. The President of the United States was the son of George Bush Sr., who was involved in the work of the Carlisle Group which managed investments from the Bin Laden family, which looked set to profit from the war which was already being spoken about. Our war against terror is only beginning. It wasn't made much better when the president, George Bush Jr., announced a massive increase in defense spending in 2003. My budget nearly doubles funding for a sustained strategy. It was made all the more potent by an earmark in the defense budget of $476 million for the development of a mobile howitzer gun called the Crusader which was manufactured by a company called United Defense, who were owned by, you guessed it, the Carlyle Group. Carlyle's head of communications, Christopher Ullman, would later say it was one of Carlyle's best investments. Defense contractors weren't the only companies increasing their share price in the years following September the 11th. Intelligence agencies were starting to swell too. For more information about that, take a look at our video on the history of NSA wiretapping. It's there. So in 2007, George Bush, as you guys know, would announce Mike McConnell as the Director of National Intelligence from his previous role at Booz Allen Hamilton. One year later, Right in the middle of his term as Director of National Intelligence, the Carlyle Group made their move to buy Booz Allen Hamilton. In 2008, Mike McConnell headed straight back to his former employer, now a Carlyle Group company. Needless to say, Forbes reported that from their initial $910 million investment, the Carlyle Group made a tidy $2 billion 
in realized and unrealized profits from the Booz Allen Hamilton deal. It's probably worth noting at this point that Mike McConnell had served as head of the National Security Agency from 1992 to 1996, and he was nominated to that position by George Bush Sr. So let the Saudi Arabians have whatever the Saudi Arabians wanted. Things have not changed significantly to the extent that things have changed at all. But now let's go further. Turkey strategically is the bridge between the Middle East and Europe. It was the cultural bridge between the two. Its founder, who came out of the Ottoman Empire, Ataturk, wanted Turkey to be sort of the way Japan is. Japan has a culture that is a mixture of Western and Eastern, but it has a Western parliamentary democracy government, and it has a uh, Western economy. That is the way that Ataturk envisioned Turkey. There would be a separation between religion and state, that the culture would be a hybrid between Western European culture and Oriental culture, and it would be economically and politically a Western country, much the way Japan is an Eastern country that is also a Western country. South Korea similarly, Singapore similarly, Taiwan similarly, Japan quintessentially. That was the original vision. Now there is a move away from it, a move to revive the Ottoman Empire under President Erdogan, a nationalist Muslim, an Islamic nationalist. No friend of Israel. We can say much about him and his ventures. He is a very, very unreliable ally within NATO. He has his own agenda, and he is pushing Turkey in the direction of Sharia, of Islamicization of, of the general culture, as opposed to a secularization of the general culture. He also is similarly dogged the way the Saudi Arabians are in Yemen with his struggle with the Kurdish people. There are 20 million Kurds who have been denied their own state for generations. They are in northern Iraq. They are in Turkey. They've never been treated rightly by other Muslims. Often, Kurds are much more open to the gospel than most Muslims generally. They're the most pro-Western, and they're the only people group in Iraq of any size that the West can trust are the Kurds. They're the only ones you can, to any degree, trust that are of any size. The Christians, of course, have been largely driven out or killed by ISIS and so forth. So he has his struggle with the Kurds. And like all Islamic nationalists, he continues to deny the Armenian genocide when 2.1 million Armenians were murdered by Turkish Islamic nationalists. Most of these Armenians, in fact all of them, were Christians. Some of them evangelical Christians. Uh, Again, this is a Holocaust that they deny. Turkey has a national policy of Holocaust denial, much the same as Communist China has a national policy of denying that Tiananmen Square ever happened. Turkey denies the Holocaust. Japan was silent about its atrocities perpetrated against the Filipinos, the Chinese, and the Koreans. Germany was forced by the Allies to recognize what they did um, in the Holocaust. Turkey has never even admitted it has happened. And Erdogan is staunch in this heritage dating back to the Ottoman Empire. He wants to in some way revive it. Now you have to understand much of coastal Turkey around Izmir, uh, <clears throat> that was the biblical city of Smyrna, those were indigenously Greek areas captured and colonized, occupied and colonized by the Turks and turned into Turkey 
Those were Greek regions. Uh, across the Bosporus, the Tepkapi area of Istanbul was Constantinople. It was a European city, taken captive, occupied, and Islamized again by the Turks. Well, he comes very much from that position. Now let's understand there has been strong resistance to Turkey coming in to the European Union. The Greeks would certainly, for historical reasons, not allow it to happen. Stupidly, recklessly, almost suicidally, David Cameron wanted Turkey in the EU, and he wanted Britain in it. Can you imagine the ramifications when you had millions and millions of more Muslims coming out of Turkey, overrunning Europe with a right to live there, extract social welfare and benefits from British and European taxpayers. That's what Cameron wanted. Well, I thank God that that terrible man is gone. He was a terrible, terrible person. Nonetheless, he said he was a conservative. Well, he didn't have his way concerning Turkey. Turkey realizes it's not going to get into Europe easily if it gets in at all. So it is going back to its Ottoman heritage to the degree it can and Erdogan is there. But let us remember something. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. It was Erdogan and Turkey who were on back of those flotillas who came to Gaza that the Israelis forcibly turned back. He's been supportive of one anti-Israel policy in the Middle East after another. His day of reckoning is coming. Turkey is heading for an economic default on its debt. This will shake the global bond markets. What happened in Mexico in the 1990s, what happened in Malaysia, that is the path that Turkey is presently on. Erdogan has as much as admitted it, and he's not changing course. It would appear at this point almost inevitable that you will see a colossal default on sovereign debt by Turkey that will have unbelievable ramifications for the international bond market, even though most of the exposure is internal. Economic judgment is coming on Turkey. Economic judgment is also, once again, coming on Russia. According to the Institute of International Finance, Russia may run out of financial reserves by mid-2017. The country has spent the past two years battling economic shortfalls, so is Russia running out of money? Well, since mid-2014, Russia has seen an ongoing recession, with wages adjusted for inflation dropping nearly 10%, and inflation itself as high as 15%. The country's currency, the ruble, has fallen dramatically in relation to the dollar, doubling from about 34 rubles per dollar to nearly 80 rubles per dollar in just six months. Many blame these economic troubles on collapsing oil prices and international sanctions. In 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine and annexed the territory of Crimea. In response, the European Union, United States, and a number of other countries imposed economic sanctions on Russian trade, businesses, and individuals. Some foreign assets were seized, debt financing was reduced, and a number of goods were prohibited from trade. Most importantly, many of these sanctions targeted the country's state-owned oil exports. In fact, oil is the leading cause for Russia's current economic crisis. Around the same period as the annexation of Crimea, oil prices worldwide collapsed. Saudi Arabia flooded the tightly controlled market, outpacing demand and cutting costs significantly. Although it's believed that this was done to halt U.S. investment in alternative sources of oil, it also affected nearly every country dependent on oil for revenue. The cost per barrel dropped from roughly $99 in June of 2014 to less than $42 on average in 2016. In response, Russia lowered its oil export dependence from 50% of its revenue in 2014 to just 37% in 2016. Budget officials also based the 2016 budget on oil prices being $50 a barrel. But as the years progressed, the real price has averaged to be considerably lower than expected. One of the biggest consequences of this recession is the country's massively depleted reserve fund. This fund is used to shore up the yearly budget, which is based on what the government projects it will receive in taxes and exports. But for the past two years, those predictions have fallen short. As of September 2016, this fund held roughly $32 billion, which is less than a quarter of what it was at its peak in 2008. But all of this doesn't mean that Russia will run out of money entirely, since the country boasts a GDP of roughly $1.3 trillion. 
but it would likely mean that the remaining shortage would come from Russia's welfare fund. The roughly $70 billion fund is intended to serve as capital for future pensions, as well as any major investments, such as infrastructure. Russia could use the fund to solve budget issues in the short term, but be left without any prospects for improvement in the future. Oil is down below $45 a barrel again and heading south. Like Saudi Arabia, Russia failed to diversify its economy. Instead, Putin tried to rebuild the Soviet war machine. That's where he put the resources instead of in economic redevelopment and improving the infrastructure of Russia, which is horrific. You drive 10, 15 miles outside of Moscow or St. Petersburg, it looks like the third world. I've been there. I've seen it. Yet they have a war machine and he's always rebuilding it and fine-tuning it. That's exactly what brought down the Soviet Union. And it's what he's doing again. I ex explained this before. For every dollar oil drops, that's two billion, two billion dollars of lost revenue a day to the Soviet economy. Two billion. Two billion. For every dollar that goes down, it's two billion of lost revenue. Quite a situation Mr. Putin has. Now he's been managing it so far by rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. He's already seen major devaluations. Sooner or later something is going to give in Russia. What men like Putin and what men like Erdogan do when they get in economic trouble that becomes social and political trouble is they begin saber rattling. Again, sharpen the swords for Gog and Magog. I'm not saying it as a prophecy, but it's not difficult to see how quickly such a scenario can transpire. Well, let's go further. Let's move on this week from Israel to Britain and Europe. In Israel, with this True News video update, I'm Doc Burkhart. Israel is known as the Holy Land, but in Tel Aviv, one of the world's largest gay pride parades is taking place as tens of thousands of homosexuals make their annual pilgrimage to the Sodom like Mecca. An estimated 200,000 people, including 30,000 tourists, participated in Tel Aviv's gay pride parade on Friday leading into the Sabbath according to the Israeli Foreign Ministry. The 18th Annual Gay Pride Parade in Tel Aviv was expected, as it always does, to draw thousands of Israelis and a large number of guests from abroad to march in the colorful parade and express this minority group's mixed feelings. Pride over the community's achievements mixed with frustration of what they feel is the discrimination still inherent in today's laws and their demand to honor every person's right to choose, quote, whom they love, unquote. I came to take part in the gay parade for two reasons. First of all, it's my party because I'm gay for many years. And I was uh, part of making this place and making this country opening to gay. And there is other reason that we try to make change in Israel, to become more open to different people. And this gay parade is just party of being different. This homosexual marching in Israel has become almost a social phenomenon in Israel, almost a cultural upheaval in the face of the religious. Thus far, it is Tel Aviv, but now Beersheba. Now, Beersheba is a religious city in Israel because of the heritage of Abraham and the patriarchs. Remember, the real aim of Satan and of the homosexual and lesbian agenda is Jerusalem, Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was also crucified. Fast forward, here we are in London. In North Kensington, an area of London saturated with immigrants from North Africa, many of them Moroccan, there was a towering inferno called Grenfell Towers this past week. The cladding on the building, it is believed may have contributed to the fire but now they're saying the insulation actually spread it quickly, causing massive asphyxiation and people being incinerated alive. 
a disproportionately large number, a majority of the people living in that tower block were Muslim families, were Islamic. Majority. It is said that they were calling out Allahu Akbar from the flames as they were incinerated alive. One can only wonder what Muslims think of being in a tower being incinerated alive as the Muslim extremists did on September 11th in New York. They're not immune from the same thing, although it was on a much smaller scale. Whether or not this is divine retribution for the terror attacks perpetrated in Britain by Muslims, bearing in mind that in every poll, two-thirds of Muslims would not notify the police authorities if they knew of a terrorist attack. Two-thirds are de facto supporters of radicalism, in effect. Uh, I cannot say that this is God's judgment. I think it's a terrible tragedy. I think it's a human tragedy. There were many non-Muslims killed in it, and there were many children, Muslim and non-Muslim. It was an absolutely horrific scene to behold. The pictures on the internet are unbelievable. A flame that huge going through a building that high and people being trapped in it when the building was actually toasted black. I drove past it the other day on my way into London and I saw it. It is unbelievable what it looks like. It's unbelievable what it looks like. Mm -hmm. However, adjacent to it is a small evangelical church of African and English saved, born-again Christians. Godly people. They're called the tabernacle. They're pro-Israel. They have a table with a menorah on it. This church was the number one, number one distributor of emergency aid to the families who did manage to escape the Grenfell Tower. Bearing in mind that even the ones who escaped likely lost family and even more than one family member. The clothes, the food, the baby food, the blankets. Everything was pouring into this little evangelical Pentecostal church of African immigrants and some English people. Flames could still be seen flickering through the windows of the Grenfell Tower apartment as residents from across London sprung into action to help survivors of the devastating fire. A relief centre not far from the disaster has been set up and many Londoners have come with bags and even whole shopping carts of food, water and clothes, offering much needed help to the victims. Temporary shelters have also been set up in a nearby gymnasium and other neighbourhoods. I live opposite. I looked out of my window and I could see the whole thing in terrible fire. I was shocked. So I came out to the church, Latimer Christian Church on the corner opposite and we've been praying with people sobbing and crying and very upset. And we've been hugging them and praying with them and giving them tea and coffee and water. It's very, very sad. We have to watch people inside being burned to death and we can't stop it. At least 12 people have been killed in the inferno and the number of deaths is expected to rise as many remain missing. My husband's family were living there. And is your husband's family okay? Uh, three of them, yeah, but we couldn't find my father in law The Grenfell Tower apartment block was home to about 600 people. Beautiful people who are, who are known for preaching the gospel in Speaker's Corner in, in London, uh, beautiful people. Some Moriel associates were there helping with the distribution efforts. I don't delight in the dying and the killing of Muslims. I don't delight in my enemies being destroyed. I'd rather see them turned to Christ. And I understand the Islamic fundamentalist mentality where kindness is seen as weakness, where there's an entitlement. They believe you must pay a penalty for not being a Muslim. They're entitled to what the infidel should pay them as the price of not being a Muslim. That is the doctrine of fundamentalist Islam. You have to pay this. Uh, 
We've spoken about this before. I understand all of that. Nonetheless, I thank Jesus that there were saved believers right on site, loving their enemies. These same people would have been persecuted in Islamic countries, but in Britain, they were loving their enemies. They were taking the babies, the children, the families. They were giving them food. They were giving them blankets. They were giving them clothing. They were welcoming them in with the love of Christ. God bless this church. God bless those believers and those Christian volunteers who were there. May the Lord use this tragedy to cause those families, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, to seek the Lord Jesus. You know, they called out in the flames, Allah, 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 Hu Akbar. Well, they found out Allah is not Akbar, he's not great. Uh, and they found out that they called out to a God who doesn't even exist. They may look upon the aid given by Christians as the demi, the penalty for not being a Muslim to which they're entitled. They can look upon it how they like. When people are desperate and they see the love of Christ in true believers, they cannot deny it no matter what their conditioning and programming and propaganda. It was a terrible, terrible tragedy. May the true God comfort every one of those families, and may the Lord God of Israel bless that faithful little church. Well, let's continue. Amidst the horrific cycle of Islamic terrorist attacks we've had outside Parliament in Manchester, and then again at London Bridge, a British nationalist, took a vehicle, and ran over 10 Muslims, killing one outside of a mosque. For years, for years, I warned this was going to be inevitable. For years, I warned it would be inevitable. The failure of the British and American and European governments to stand up to radical Islam, to stop the immigration of fundamentalist Muslims, to stop the movement to enforce Sharia on Western democracies, the failure to round up these radicals and deport them, the failure of the British government to act, the failure of Cameron, the failure of Theresa May, the failure of Tony Blair, the failure of the British government to do what needed to be done. And it's not just Britain. The ugly betrayal of America by George Bush and the Bush administration continuing express visas for Saudi Arabians a year after September 11th, despite most of the hijackers being Saudi Arabians. Uh, just the betrayal of America. Uh, certainly the betrayal by the Obama administration, and now the betrayal of America by these left-wing judges who we can't vet who are trying to kill us, even after Orlando, even after San Bernardino. Uh, this outrageous insanity we've seen in America and in Britain and certainly in France and in Germany by Angela Merkel, etc. This insanity has a ramification. They are going to force people to defend themselves. If governments will not protect the people from radical Islam, people will be forced to protect themselves, their families, their neighborhoods and their countries because corrupt politicians will not. Now, I do not agree with running these Muslims over. I do not sanction it. I do not endorse it. I'm simply saying it is a predictable and inevitable reaction. And unless governments stand up to radical Islam and to the issue of the immigration of fundamentalists and to the imposition of Sharia on Western countries, unless they carry out the deportations of Muslims necessary and the closure of fundamentalist mosques and madrasas and Islamic institutions that are Wahhabist, that are Saudi-funded institutions that promote Sharia and engender support for terror. Unless our own governments stand up and do that, people will have no choice but to defend themselves, their families, their neighborhoods, and their countries. 
what this man did was wrong. I don't think he should get the Victoria Cross. I don't think he's a hero. But I don't want to see this kind of thing happen again. But it will happen again. In fact, if governments do not change their policy, it's inevitable. It must happen again. And when you get an administration, a government like Trump, who at least makes some effort to stop it, the political left, the mainstream media, and judges who should be removed from the bench prevent them from doing it. What are people supposed to do? I lost family on September 11th. I've seen terrible terrorist attacks in Israel. I've seen all kinds of things. What are people supposed to do? Continue to listen to the lies? That it's all Islamophobia? Continue listening to the lies of left-wing academics? The lies of the mainstream media? The lies of judges who should be thrown off the bench into the gutter of judicial history where they belong? Listen to the lies of left-wing politicians. No. People will stand up and defend themselves if their governments won't. It's inevitable that this happened. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I'm sorry it happened. I don't want to see it happen again. But it will happen again. Unless government stands up and does what it needs to. But the Conservative Party and the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats, above all, in Great Britain, we can be sure, will put politics before people. They'll put political correctness before common sense. They will put not offending the radical Islamic community before the lives and welfare of British citizens. They will do that. The same as they turned a blind eye to the trafficking of white women by Islamic criminal gangs in Rotherham, England, so as not to offend the Muslims. Same as Mueller. Yes, the special prosecutor changed the training manual at the demand of the Saudi-funded Council for American Islamic Relations for counter-terror to remove things that Muslims found offensive, such as saying Islamic terror. The FBI has removed material that may be offensive to Muslims from its anti-terror training guidelines. A report from Judicial Watch shows that materials linking the Muslim Brotherhood to terrorism or profiling terrorists as young male immigrants of Middle Eastern appearance are now gone. The Bureau calls such references unsuitable in the current political context. An independent group of subject matter experts reviewed the FBI's training curricula on counterterrorism. They recommended the removal of presentations and curricula on Islam from FBI offices around the country. This is Mueller. This is the kind of political riffraff we have in power in the courts, in the judiciary, and too often in elected offices. Canada has gone from one of the most common sense countries under its former prime minister to something that's gone completely insane. It has a legislation called M-130, where if you speak critically of Islam, it's a hate crime. Even if you express an opinion, you can be prosecuted as a hate crime. It doesn't cover anti-Semitism or anti-Christian or anti-Hindu or anti-anybody else. It's only about Muslims privileged class. And of course, it's backed by Mr. Trudeau, their new prime minister. His father was an absolutely inept political farce. And he's no different. Canada has, has, has almost lost its mind. This week, Canadian court has ruled sex with animals is legal. Bestiality is legal in Canada. This actually happened. You can't criticize Islamic fundamentalism uh, and Sharia. Uh, and if you say in Saudi Arabia women can't drive a car and there's people in Canada who agree with that and would like to see it in Canada, that could be considered a hate crime. But if you want to have sex with an animal, that's all right. Speaking of oral sex with animals, that's what it was about. This is Canada. The Lord is indeed coming. The Lord is indeed coming soon. Further afield, North Korea is testing rocket engines this week. 
And the collision of the USS Fitzgerald is very, very mysterious, with a lot of contradictions in the report. Hey everybody, welcome to AMTV, Alternative Media Television. My name is Chad Booksam. What really happened to the USS Fitzgerald? The search for answers after a deadly collision at sea between a U.S. Navy destroyer and a cargo ship that killed seven Navy sailors. Now this is what we're getting from reports. Over the Father's Day weekend, a cargo ship supposedly collided with the USS Fitzgerald early in the morning when it was still dark and seven Navy sailors died. And they died because a gash in the bottom of the Navy uh, vessel let in so much water, the ship was about to sink, and they had to close the hatch or the whole ship would have went down. And that cost the lives of seven Navy sailors, which, which alone is just a disaster, a catastrophe, and very sad given the situation. Now, there's a lot of confusion surrounding this collision because the misinformation is coming from the sources, the U.S. military and Japanese officials. First of all, they were off on the time. They first said it happened at 2.30, right? And then they changed it to 1.30, the Japanese officials did. And then the U.S. military was like, no, it happened at 2.30. And then after they went behind scenes and behind closed doors, they all agreed to 1.30. So that alone makes it smell fishy, okay? That alone makes it smell fishy. Also, on top of that, the Japanese company who charters... The ACX Crystal, that's the name of the cargo ship, will not tell us, will not tell us where the destination of the cargo ship was going. Will not tell us the original destination of the cargo ship. Why? Now, what we've heard from reports is all of the personnel on the cargo ship were Filipino. All Filipino. And right now they are docked in Tokyo, but they have not released the original destination of the cargo ship. Now, another point, uh, we see from maritime reports, not from really media reports, but anybody can log on to these maritime locations where shipping, or where, uh, shipping routes are, where ships are, and you can see their location. And what's been pinpointed by just regular citizens around the world is that the ACX Crystal did a sharp right turn right before the collision against the USS Fitzgerald, meaning it was targeting it, meaning it was targeting it. Now. If that didn't happen, let's take a look. First of all, the USS Navy vessel has awesome high-tech technology, radar systems, military radar systems, missile defense systems. This cargo ship's not that small. It's pretty big, actually. Nowhere near big the Navy vessel, but any radar on any ship would be able to detect the cargo ship, especially on a high-tech Navy vessel like the USS Fitzgerald. So, what happened? What happened? Now, obviously, there's a lot of personnel on the U.S. Navy vessel. The captain was asleep at the time. This is what they're telling us. And they just didn't see it on radar. Or, they turned off their radar. But the Navy is calling this one of the worst at-sea disasters in decades. These kind of collisions with Navy vessels are so rare. It happens like once or twice every like three or four decades because the radar and communication technology they have on these ships is impeccable. This is not supposed to happen unless they allow it happen, allow it to happen. Now also with a collision like this, you would think on the cargo ship, there were about 20 people on the cargo ship, that somebody would have been injured, right? With this kind of collision against this huge Navy ship, but nothing, nothing, nothing. And the damage on the cargo ship is like nothing. And this Navy vessel received major damage. Now, it would take a lot of force to create the kind of destruction to that ship that you see. You don't just have destruction on the deck, you have it at the bottom, the huge gas that almost sunk the ship. This is major damage. Major damage. And given the fact that we're in an area where we have lots of enemies, and they're not telling us something, we need to know who was on that cargo ship besides their race, what was on that cargo ship, and what was its destination. We need to know that. Second, we need to know the, the cargo ship and the personnel on this ship waited almost an hour to contact Japanese authorities or anybody regarding the collision. What did you think if you ran in right to a U.S. Navy vessel, you'll call somebody right away? There's red flags all over this. Uh, this could be something that is going to lead in to something bigger, given the fact that 
false flags usually are a little hesitant at first and then you're going to see it build up and through this investigation if we find out that it is due to an enemy like North Korea we already know that it's a false flag given the fact that they've been hiding everything a lot of misinformation it is stirring speculation that it may have been a terrorist attack or something that is not on the up and up I do not know what the situation is but I do know that the area of the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea <clears throat> and the, the militarized zone between North and South Korea is becoming increasingly intense. The United States had a failed interceptor missile test this week. In my personal view, why develop an interception missile system, an anti-ballistic missile system, to defend against North Korea when we can just go in and wipe out their capacity if we put our minds to it. Again, this is the ugly legacy of Harry Truman who followed Douglas MacArthur. We can thank Harry Truman for what's happening in Korea to this day. He was a vile man, but he's somebody who left us with a mess. It's amazing how politicians do that. <clears throat> they leave you with a mess that you can't easily get yourself out of. <clears throat> Barack Obama's deficits, his collapsing Obamacare, they leave you with a mess. They leave office and write a book after they leave the next generation with a mess. We've gone into generational theft. Again, nations get the leaders they deserve. It can be quite ugly and quite frustrating, but that is indeed what is happening. I mentioned North Korea because North Korea has either used or sold every weapon it has ever developed. Watch out for the links between North Korea, Syria, and Iran. It is a very serious business. The Israelis are well, well aware of it. And so we've had quite a week in prophecy. In the Middle East, in Turkey, in Israel in the UK and in the USA. On one final note, the fifth congressional election held since the election of Donald Trump and the defeat of Hillary Clinton, the fifth, in the sixth congressional district in Georgia. It was the most funded political campaign for the House of Representatives in history, $56 million most of it spent by the Democratic Party. They made it a national referendum on Trump or a local referendum on the national mood concerning Donald Trump. They brought in the Hollywood heavies, the heavy hitters from Washington, and they poured in not millions, but tens of millions to get this person named Ossoff elected. Mr. Ossoff didn't even live in the district for which he was running against the Republican candidate. Well, they lost for the fifth time. They have not been able to win a single congressional election. The Democrat Party now is divided between those who say we should stop running from the center and move to the extreme left. Some say we need to go to our base like women. Women? 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump. So did 26% of Hispanic women and a smaller percentage of Afro-American women. Put it together. The National Organization of Women and the feminist movement do not represent all women because they don't represent most women statistically. But they say they're the party of women. They're living in a delusion. Just to follow up, Democrats have lost 60 seats over the past six years, so why should you keep your job? Well, they, look, they went, tell you something, when, when we lost 54 seats, something like that, when President Clinton was president. And so history is on our side. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. When President Clinton was elected in 92, in 94, I think it was 54 seats the Democrats lost with a Democrat in the White House. When President uh, Bush was president, we won the Congress, winning over 30 seats of the uh, nearly double what we needed to win the Congress. When President Obama was president, again, the 60 seats you referenced. Uh, so again, we have a Republican in the White House 
we believe there's real opportunity. Now, it's not a slam dunk. History is on our side, but it, is, it takes strategic, unified, and um, disciplined. Uh, we have, we have um, harmony. It doesn't always mean we have unanimity, but we do have unity when it comes to fighting that fight. So you want me to sing my praises? Is that what you're saying? Why should I? Well, I'm a, a master legislator. I am a, a strategic, politically astute leader. I am, uh, a, my uh, uh, leadership is recognized by many around the country, and that is why I'm able to attract the support that I do, which is essential uh, to our election, sad to say. 29% of Hispanics voted for Mr. Trump. Although only 8% of American black women voted for Mr. Trump, about 17% of Afro-American males did. But many more did not vote for Hillary Clinton. They just stayed home and wouldn't vote for either candidate. They don't have the base they think they have. They don't have the base they think they have. Their left-wing judges turned their backs on the homosexual community after Orlando wanting to let more killers in the country people you can't vet. They don't have the base they think they have. Nonetheless, the charade goes on. The mainstream media does not have the power it once had. It is losing popularity, and it is losing credibility, and it is losing those things fast. In fact, to a large degree, it's already lost it. And it won't be able to retrieve it social media, internet, alternative sources of news, independent news networks. That's the future. It's over, CNN. It's over, MSNBC. And Fox better realize, Fox has committed suicide. It's over for Fox now, too. It's not coming back. Fox is not going to be what it was in the days of Roger Ailes and Glenn Beck and in the days of Bill O'Reilly. It's over. Mainstream media has had its day. Young people don't even want to hear it. And who can blame them? Declining popularity and declining credibility. Yet they keep playing the same game over and over and over. The same nonsense. They tried to claim that Mr. Trump was in bed with the Russians. That crazy woman, the... the, 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 the Rachel Maddow said that Mr. Trump is a Russian op, an operative. Now, we had a film, a film of Barack Obama not knowing he was being recorded, telling the Russians that when I get reelected, I can make more concessions to you. This is my last election, please. Yeah. After my election, I have more flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I transmit this information to Vladimir and Mr. If anybody was in bed with the Russians, it was obviously Barack Obama, but the mainstream media didn't say a word when there was grounds for a special prosecutor over Hillary Clinton and over Lois Lerner and over James Clapper. There was no calls for a special prosecutor. Now that the Russian case has collapsed, Clapper admitted there's nothing to it. Uh... <clears throat> Homie, Comey admitted there's nothing to it. So now that's gone. Now they need another straw to grab onto. So now they're trying to find obstruction of justice. <laughs> if you want obstruction of justice, what about when Bill Clinton met with Loretta Lynch? How come they didn't have a problem then? It's all hypocrisy. They've lost too much credibility and they're declining too fast. They just don't matter anymore. That is very, very fortunate. So where should we get our news? Where can we listen to real experts who can tell us what's really happening and why? And what it means and where it's all going and how it's going to end. I can give you a news source that's never been wrong and that has always been honest. It never embellishes anything. It tells the truth about everybody and everything. 
It can not only tell you what is happening, it can tell you why it's happening and how it's going to end. The best news source there's ever been, there will never be another one that comes close to it. Sora Scriptura, the Word of God, Biblical Prophecy. I don't care what Fox says anymore. I don't care what CNN says to begin with. I don't care about MSNBC or CBS or the New York Slimes. I've got this. I look at these events in light of Scripture, and any Christian with the Holy Spirit of average intelligence can know a lot more than all of those liars and hypocrites in Washington, in Whitehall, and elsewhere. Here it is. The best news source there's ever been, and the best news source there will ever be. That's This Week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you from the UK. We'll be speaking to you, Lord willing, next week from Bulgaria. But thank you so much for listening. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But... In this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed for the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.